But before then, we have these more folk religions. Um, maybe there's some, sh some uh, differentiation between shamans and others, although the shaman isn't necessarily a part of a hierarchy like a priest is. Um, but before the shamans, perhaps everybody was sort of, there were no distinctive division of la spiritual labor. Everyone was kind of doing more or less the same thing. Sh we have the earliest known burial of a shaman around 32,000 years ago. But what was happening before then? Well, we go back in time, around 70,000 years ago, there's a, a, a giant stone in the African Kalahari Desert that's been dated to about then, resembling a python, accompanied by a hidden chamber, surrounded by broken spearheads, possibly, and again, we don't know, we're interpreting here, possibly the, uh, the site of ritual offerings and snake worship. And then uh, human skeletal remains in Israel, stained with, with red ochre and accompanied with a variety of grave goods, so there's clearly some burial practices going on, hominid, human burial practices, not just hominid. And then the earliest um, evidence for intent, uh, undisputed evidence, there's earlier evidence which is disputed, but the earliest undisputed evidence for intentional burial, which is the earliest uh, clear signs of some kind of belief in the afterlife and therefore some kind of religious belief, 130,000 years ago, not human, but Neanderthal, but ne nevertheless clearly hominid related, closely related to us. So there's a lot of stuff going on before organized religion and it's helpful to sort of keep this in mind because it uh, allows, it reminds us how ancient, how pervasive a feature of uh, human society religions are. It's also of course uh, not just um, pervasive in time but pervasive uh, in, geograph in geographical terms so we find all sorts of sort of strangely dressed people all around the world practicing their religions, uh, Africa, India, uh, Haiti, Rome. And um, so all of these kinds of, uh, you know, this kind of universal and ancient behavior strongly suggests that there's got to be some kind of evolutionary explanation. Now, evolutionary explanations come in many uh, guises many forms and they don't necessarily have to involve explaining things by reference to a gene but that's what peop most people think of when they think of an evolutionary explanation they think oh right evolutionary exp explanation for homosexuality the gay gene okay evolutionary explanation for religion the god gene okay but it doesn't have to be that of course that's one possibility and that's perhaps the most obvious possibility in one that Dean Hainer here explored in his uh, 2004 book, The God Gene, in which he I identifies a particular gene, VMAT2, which does not, I should add, I should emphasize, encode for the belief in God, as the title of his book misleadingly suggests, but rather encodes for a particular um, neurotransmitter or rather transporter which uh, helps neurotransmission and which he argues is correlated there's some variability in this gene in other words it's uh, it's uh, polymorphic some people have one version of the gene other people have different versions of the gene and whether depending on what version of the gene you have you are more or less likely to have certain mystical experiences or have certain experiences which score highly on certain accepted uh, means for measuring mystical experiences and so it's not really a God gene at all in fact uh, you know, he makes that clear in his book but obviously the God gene is a good title for selling books I'm not going to be exploring that kind of hypothesis here what I want to explore is rather s slightly different kind of evolutionary hypothesis it's a hypothesis not about genes but about uh, mental traits because even if we've got a God gene it still doesn't explain why? Okay, and if you believe in, you know, if you accept the basic tenets of evolutionary biology, if there's a God gene, then, and if it's been favored by natural selection, it would have to convey some advantage. And then, of course, you would need a hypothesis about what evolutionary advantage that gene was conveying to those who had it. So even if you postulate the existence of a God gene, it's still not really very much of an evolutionary explanation. An evolutionary explanation, you need some kind of story about the adaptive nature of the characteristics, okay? And that's still not clear from Dean Hamer's book.
So I want to talk about some other kinds of hypotheses which have to do with the mental traits we have and which I will argue make it much more easier for people to believe in God or to believe in generally in religious ideas than not. In other words, I, I will be arguing to sort of uh, that that, that we are in some sense born to believe. It's in the sense that it's not deterministic, clearly not, otherwise there would be no atheists here, but it is, put it this way, there, there are developmental <coughs> tendencies which make it much more likely for us to believe in religious ideas than not. The tendencies uh, have to do with virtue, some characteristics, psychological characteristics which are widespread and innate, pretty universal, and these characteristics are here. Apophenia, memorable anomalies, informational encapsulation, and credence heuristics. Now, I'll spend most of this talk talking about most of these. So what do I mean by apophenia? Apophenia is a technical term for seeing patterns in random data. It was, the term was coined by Klaus Conrad in 1958. Um, one of the most, uh, of, sort of, uh, maybe the most clear example of it, of apophenia, is the so-called clustering illusion, where we uh, tend to um, perceive small samples from random distributions as having significant streaks or clusters. Okay, and this is uh, linked with a widespread tendency in humans to underpredict the amount of variability that's likely to appear in a small sample of random or semi-random data due to chance. So, um, for example, the psychologist Thomas Gilovich found that uh, this sequence of heads and tails, which was actually generated randomly, was thought by most people to, who he showed it to, to be non-random. When in fact it has several characteristics that m are maximally probable for a random stream, such as an equal number of heads and tails and an equal number of adjacent heads and tails, um, with the same outcome for, for both possibilities. But in sequences like this, people seem to expect a greater number of alternations than you would actually predict, statistically. And the probability of an alternation in a sequence of independent random binary events is 0.5. Yet when you actually measure it, people seem to expect an alteration rate, alternation rate of about 0.7. In fact, in a short number of trials, variability in non-random looking streets are actually quite probable. But people are intuitively bad at statistics. That's why it takes so long to drill statistics into them, doesn't it? I so <laughs> so we are intuitively bad statisticians. The fact that we're intuitively bad at statistics makes us prone to perceive patterns where there are none, because we misunderstand the nature of randomness. So um, if you couple that with, a, with, a, with the idea that natural selection seems to favor a bias often towards type 1 errors, you can get some quite powerful forces in the human mind that make us uh, more see patterns where there are none. What do I mean by type 1 errors? What I mean is I seeing things that aren't there rather than not seeing things that are there. Now, in our many systems, you can argue that we have many, in our perceptual system, we have many different uh, uh, heuristics that cause us to short circuit the evidence, so to speak, and uh, leap to conclusions. And this is obvious for an evolutionary benefit. Those conclusions that we leap to are going to be erroneous. We're not going to be perfectly accurate all the time in identifying patterns and separating random from non-random patterns. So, given that we're likely to make mistakes, should evolution favor us sort of make us favor or make our perceptual systems bias towards type 1 errors or type 2? Well, generally, it makes sense for even in many circumstances, it makes sense for evolution or natural selection, I should say, to favor the evolution of mechanisms that make us more likely to perceive things that aren't there than to fail to perceive things that are. Take the fear system, for example. It's better to make a false positive than a false negative. It's better to falsely identify a stick on the ground as a snake than to mistake a snake for a snake. Sorry, a snake for a stick. For obvious reasons, okay? So you, the cost of a false negative is much greater than the cost of the false positive. Link those two things together and you get, of course, people very often mistaking random patterns for real patterns. For example, 
Tristan Woodray, or may not, depict our lady, is causing quite a stir in County Day. The people of Mount Keel seem determined to prevent it from being destroyed. To some it may look like the stump of a tree, to others it's a religious image. A city stream of people passed through the gates of St Mary's Church in Rath Keel again today. Since Monday, hundreds from Limerick and the surrounding counties have arrived to view a tree stump, which people believe depicts an image of the Blessed Virgin. Here we are, what do you think of it? Oh, it's just magnificent. Just, just something different. It's about time something that is happening in the town. It's drawn off from the crowd saying it should be left there. What do you think when you look at it? I see, I see the vision of our lady.